Well, James O'Hara, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. I've been really excited about this one. Yeah, Ben, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to get started. So how how did you, you have a very um a very unique niche on uh, a lots of um very intricate topics like hair loss, like uh, male hormone optimization, TRT. Um, how did that come about? Yeah, uh, it's a, a good question. So I guess I've always been slightly obsessed with sort of performance, you know, being my best, performing at my best. So um, I suppose, I suppose, for selfish reasons, that's why I've had an interest in this area. Um, but with the, I'd say over the last decade or so, the interest the public has taken in, you know, optimization in various niches and just taking a general interest in health overall, you know, perhaps that's the silver lining of, of COVID is now people are like, oh, there's things I, I can and should be doing to, um, make my body more resilient to, to have better health overall. So, um, I, I've been in healthcare working as a nurse for almost 10 years now. Uh, in my current practice, I'm a nurse practitioner, so I can go all the way upstream and be uh, very proactive and preventive. Whereas at the beginning of my career, you know, working on a, a cardiac floor, that's sort of the these heroic um, sort of last ditch efforts where we're putting stents in people, helping people recover after strokes, open heart surgery. So kind of moving upstream of that is where I naturally gravitated to. Okay, so more more prevention as opposed to, uh, uh, I guess, red lights flashing everywhere and um, time is now to sort of intervene. Um, the world has definitely shifted towards that prevention um, piece. And uh, as you said, COVID is this uh, catalyst for agency over your own health. I think more people than ever know that they have the tools to actually change their health, be it um, you know their mitochondrial health, their VO2 max, you know, their rate of hair loss, whatever it is. Um, and maybe that's a good place to start because I, I know uh, you and Dr. Carl Gillette have a wonderful video on hair loss on YouTube. And um, I think it's sort of required for any man or or woman actually uh, who's sort of struggling with it or maybe want to know a little bit more. So maybe uh, to start, what is the biggest misconception around male and female hair loss? Um, I wouldn't say it's probably that people don't realize it's um, optional for most people. So there are going to be some cases, outliers, where there's a scarring form of hair loss that you know is not going to be reversible. Um, and not everyone is going to, even on the most, say, aggressive hair loss protocol, going to be able to fully prevent hair loss. But I think some people just don't know that there are options out there. You know, it's not something that has become very mainstream until I suppose some of these telemedicine platforms running their you know, commercials on TV and so forth have brought a little bit more attention to it. So I would say that's sort of the biggest misconception. And then um, another one would be that there's just a singular cause. Um, so there's many, many factors involved in um, hair loss that people experience, even within a subset of something like androgenic alopecia, which is male pattern baldness. How does male, I, I guess, uh, how do when males lose their hair and versus females lose their hair, how do the root causes differ there? Yeah, so there, there's some common themes and there's some differences. So one difference is that women are much more likely to be iron deficient and have that as a driver of the hair loss. And you will see a slightly different pattern. Um, that to be clear, women can have male pattern hair loss. Um, it's just how sensitive are they to androgens? What's their androgen load exposure over time? So you can see the same, you know, crown thinning and temple recession that you do in men and women. Um, but due to menstrual blood loss and the under screening and under treatment of iron deficiency, many women will have iron deficiency that sort of causes this um, diffuse hair loss, not a strictly a male pattern baldness um, sort of pattern you would look at. So there's that. Um, traction alopecia that's probably going to be more common in women as well where maybe they're putting the hair in a you know very tight ponytail and they're losing some hair because that constant tension that's put on the hairline from that pulling uh, of course with different sorts of braiding you can see this um, where it creates a hair loss that is reversible um, and you just sort of you know stop doing the thing that's causing that tension or traction uh, but it's much more common in men due to our hormone profile primarily 
Uh, we have a lot more testosterone, which leads to a lot more downstream DHT. So that's by far the most common that you're going to see in men is that male pattern baldness that you know, as close as we can get to a root cause is the inflammation that follows DHT exposure. So testosterone gets converted into a much more potent androgen. Um, depending on the paper you look at, maybe it's four to 10 times more androgenic, uh, not anabolic. So DHT has some anabolic activity, meaning it, it would support some muscle mass, um, but uh, it's not something that is going to be 10 times as anabolic and give you 10 times as much muscle um, just to kind of differentiate between androgenic and anabolic there. So that's probably the most common you see if you walk around and you look at a guy and you see he's losing his hair or he's bald, it's most likely going to be, um, androgenic alopecia, but you have to look at these other things as well. Um, nutrition status, um, and when we get into blood working, we can really look at uh, a lot of different metrics that can go into that plan we put together. So this comes to the sort of the set, um, maybe the central issue with when it comes to male hair loss with, okay, if it is a, uh, I guess, um, androgenic alopecia, uh, if, if, if that's the term, can people choose, what do males who want to prioritize their hormones, their testosterone and their DHT, how do they, um, balance losing their hair and combating, um, androgenic alopecia with optimal hormone? function and good DHT levels. Yeah, there's a couple different routes you can take it in sort of like a sliding scale of how aggressive one wants to be. Um, just using a topical dutasteride. Um, so this is like a solution that you would put on the scalp, like, um, Rogaine or minoxidil is a topical, but that's really just a, a growth agonist. It just speeds up hair growth. It doesn't actually seem to prevent the further loss. Um, now that being said, if somebody, <clears throat> somebody starts minoxidil today, odds are they're going to have more hair five years from now than they do today because they're keeping more follicles in a growth phase. But as far as balancing between, you know, how much DHT do I want or need? How much testosterone do I want or need? That's the place to start is to make sure if you are going to intervene with something to reduce DHT, that you have plenty of testosterone around to fulfill the androgenic functions in the body because a, a pretty good way to give somebody adverse side effects like mood changes, loss of libido, erectile quality issues is to, you know, not check somebody's labs, have somebody with low testosterone, and then put them on a relatively high dose of dutasteride orally. So if they're taking a, a capsule every single day and they already have low testosterone to begin with, odds are you're going to create side effects in some patients. But a topical is a really nice way for some people to get more local effect. And it, it still does seem to go systemic a small amount. So if you're using a, a 1%, maybe you're getting 5 to 15% uh, systemic reduction of DHT. Um, but that's nowhere near the 90% you would get in that former scenario where somebody's taking dutasteride every single day as a capsule. Right. I see. Okay. So the mechanism of action is it lowers DHT much like a sore palmetto might do or, um, uh, other topical things, not minoxidil, but, um, what's the other one? Finasteride. Does finasteride work in the same mechanism and why wouldn't someone just use finasteride? Yeah. So finasteride is probably more prescribed. Um, I very rarely will prescribe it unless someone comes to me already on it and they're doing great. Um, occasionally if someone has a very aggressive case, they may use dutasteride and finasteride together. So I, I think topical to, uh, finasteride is probably about equal in terms of popularity with topical dutasteride. Uh, they essentially have the same mechanism of action, but the finasteride is a smaller drug molecule. So it's able to get more systemic absorption. Um, which is a pro and a con. You get more of a systemic effect from it, but if you're using a topical, you're probably trying to get less of a systemic effect. And then within the 5-alpha reductase enzyme, so this is the enzyme that takes your testosterone and it potentiates it, makes it more androgenic, makes it stronger, converting that into the DHT. That is, um, actually has three different subtypes and probably up until 10 years ago, um, it was only thought that there were two subtypes of that enzyme. 
and dutasteride will have some activity on all three. Um, finasteride has activity on two out of the three. So that's why if someone is taking, say, uh, the most common is probably a milligram of finasteride every day. I tend to have people take a bit lower than that. Um, and say someone's taking half a milligram of dutasteride every single day. That's why you'll see only a 70% reduction in DHT with finasteride but, you know, a 90, maybe even 95% reduction in DHT with an oral dutasteride. So the dutasteride is you know, stronger, I suppose you could say, um, but it also seems to cause less side effects because um, the type 2 5-alpha reductase um, is more heavily expressed in the general skin, and that is the type 2 that finasteride is actually more potent at inhibiting. I think it's about a fourfold a uh, stronger inhibitor there. So for that reason, I tend to go to dutasteride because if I'm trying to get a local effect, I can use the dutasteride, not really move the needle that much on serum DHT um, because for some men who have a lower androgen pool, less net androgens, so maybe that form a scenario where their testosterone is a little bit lower, but they still want to do something for hair loss, it's not going to sort of nuke their androgens and cause mood changes and this sort of thing. Because it, 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 because it plays off a, the type 2 receptor. Yeah, so that's why finasteride is perhaps, um, I'm going to say for most people, they're not going to have a terrible adverse outcome from it. But for some people that do experience you know, side effects from these medications, the finasteride is more likely to. Yeah. Uh, and the theoretical reason why is that it, it's going to block more DHT in the genital skin as opposed to dutasteride, which is just going to be more in non-genital skin. Um, and you get a bit more you know, net reduction in the scalp with dutasteride because it is stronger. Okay, right, that makes sense. And with that, uh, with that reduction in DHT, is the benefit of, um, or I guess is the efficacy of how much sort of hair loss it will prevent, is it, how efficacious is, is it essentially? Yeah, so if you look at finasteride, you know, it's going to halt hair loss for 80 to 90% of guys within the first year. So you're, you're sort of stabilizing things. And then about half of those guys will get some regrowth. We don't have the same quality of data with dutasteride because it is considered off-label, uh, meaning it doesn't actually have an indication for this purpose, even though it works very well for this purpose. Um, but you would expect the numbers to be slightly better than that. So probably closer to that 90, 95% is going to stabilize and then probably closer to 60, 70% getting some regrowth, assuming they're just doing the dutasteride, you know, they're not adding in something like topical minoxidil or other growth agonists. So as far as the effectiveness, it is quite good. Um, but I think it's important to pick the right patients for the treatment because it's not necessarily a one size fits all. Okay. Um, that, that, that's very clear. Um, I'm always on the podcast, I always end up talking about Lollapalooza effects because they come up so much of multiple things stacked in tandem, working towards a common goal, you reach a nonlinear outcome and you sort of get off the linear curve and you got sort of a nonlinear curve. You're talking about, um, stacking sort of redox therapies in cancer with Don D'Agostino or talking about how in various different long COVID things, it, it just keeps coming up over and over. And, um, I feel like it comes up in this topic as well with regards to what you can stack with dutasteride to amplify the effect of hair regrowth and, um, stopping the, uh, I guess stopping further hair loss. So with that in mind, what can we stack with dutasteride to be, be get this to be even more effective? Yeah. So, I mean, looking at things that would create a suboptimal environment for hair growth, you want to make sure those boxes are checked off and you're correcting those things. So that could be as simple as, you know, somebody who's a smoker, um, that's going to create a poor environment for hair growth. Uh, I think they actually have some identical twin studies there where you can see that the identical twin who was smoking is experiencing more hair loss compared to the non-smoking identical twin. Those are always kind of cool studies to look at. Um, and then the iron status, that's probably going to be the biggest thing you want to have that sort of, you know, foundational, um, nutrient um, status in there. So iron, having a, you know, um, nutrient rich diet. So lots of whole foods, I say that have a lot of sugar sweetened beverages and 
you know, processed foods, meaning uh, in my definition of this is like the percent of calories from just empty carbohydrate, like glucose and fats is quite high and they're generally low in protein and low in vitamins. Um, those things are not going to be creating a good environment for hair growth. So you sort of want to have the environment primed. Um, and then you can look at, you know, on paper, you know, what is someone's vitamin D, B vitamins, um, their iron status, these sorts of things. And then you can begin, let's say you, the dutasteride with a, an expectation that this isn't going to probably make a huge difference in three months. This is more of a six to 12 to 18 month to see your, like what you're getting out of the drug. Um, and then you have growth agonists. So someone that says, well, you know, I want to make sure I'm addressing the main driver, which for most people is going to be the DHT, but there's like, I want to see results a little bit faster. So that's where you can get into things that are cheap and effective, like uh, minoxidil that anyone can go and buy over the counter, uh, commonly causes some scalp irritation if it has the propylene glycol in it. Um, so some people do better with a foam that doesn't have that in there. And then there is, and this one's a prescription, uh, latanoprost, which is a, a medication used for glaucoma. It's a, an eye drop and it's a, uh, works along the prostaglandin pathway, which is different than the minoxidil, which they still don't know why the minoxidil works. Um, it, it's a vasodilator. Um, it seems to open up blood vessels in the scalp and beyond that, they don't have a like, you know, exact mechanism of action. That's one of the fun things about science and medicine is we still don't know precisely how everything works. So there's a lot to be figured out still. Those are probably the two most common topical things that people would add. Um, the pharmacy may look at you a little bit funny if you go in and get, you know, 15 little eyedropper, uh, you know, droplet bottle that are two and a half milliliters a piece. Uh, but you can use those on the scalp and, and now they're generic and, uh, very cheap as well. Okay. So just, just to be clear, you, you can't put it in the eye and expect results. You'd have to apply this topically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and it would say on the, the label of your prescription that this applied to the scalp, um, putting it in the eyes, you do see eyelash growth. Um, you wouldn't want to do that unless you have a medical reason to, but that's where I forget the company, but there's a, you know, one of these companies in the aesthetic space that mm. marketed Latisse, which is just a higher concentration latanoprost. And that's what women will apply to their upper eyelid to make their lashes grow. Oh. Um, so it, it can cause some skin irritation at that higher concentration, probably the most common side effect, but you know, it's one of those serendipitous discoveries where, you know, we were treating people's glaucoma and then you find out, oh, by the way, this happened. And then a company's like, oh, like people want this. We can make this into a treatment. Mm. Just to rebrand re it and, uh, and, and let's go. It's funny how often that happens. Obviously the famous case with Viagra, which was no, yeah. no, not, not, uh, not used for any sexual reasons at all, um, initially, and then obviously turned and blockbuster drug. Um, okay. So just running off on hair loss, is there anything, um, so we have Dutasteride, we have checking all the sort of mineral deficiencies, micronutrients, macronutrients, I guess, as well would be important. And as you said, making sure that the global environment in your body is conducive for hair growth. Um, with regards to females specifically, is there any reason why this protocol is sex specific for males and females couldn't use this or how would, how would the approach differ if at all? Yeah. So women have testosterone and DHT just like men. Um, Although you, you wouldn't think so if you look at some of the letters I get from pharmacies, like I, I will commonly send a prescription for dutasteride for a female patient and they'll say like, is this right? This is a drug for males. You know, why are you sending this for a female? And I, I will intentionally write on there, like women have DHT too and have our staff fax that back to the pharmacy. So all these principles apply to both men and women. If you look at the ratios of like how much testosterone is converted to DHT in men and women. Um, women have a lower, much lower absolute total testosterone, um, but they convert actually a higher percentage into DHT. So it's possible that if you have a male with, let's say, a very low total testosterone, uh, maybe a hundred nanogram per deciliter, which would be quite low. Like every clinician out there is going to look at that and say, this is a low testosterone. And a woman with a testosterone of, you know, let's say maybe 25 nanogram per deciliter, they may have the exact same DHT level, just kind of mind boggling to think about. They just convert much more to DHT. 
So these same things do apply to women. Um, you know, the caveat, like I mentioned, much more common that they will need a uh, an iron supplement or to add more iron to their diet, cook with cast iron, these sorts of things. So a lot of it can be lifestyle based. Mm. Um, and then as far as the ferritin target, uh, like that's the blood marker you would check to see what is my iron level. Um, in the context of at least a normal C-reactive protein, you do want to check those two together to make sure your ferritin isn't just normal because you have a lot of inflammation going on and that would sort of falsely elevate it, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, you want to target probably above 50. So if you're at 16, that's going to be considered normal on most labs, but most people in dermatology and you know, they're treating hair loss will target above 50. Um, that's where you're going to see, like, you're going to have more of a reservoir for one. And that's where you're also going to see other benefits of having optimal iron status, like your exercise capacity, exercise endurance, energy levels sure. in general. They tend to be better with the ferritin a little bit higher than just like a sufficient level. Okay, wonderful. That's good to know. Yeah, norm, norm, normal is not often uh, healthy in labs, right? It's an uh, it, interesting tangent. Um, where does microneedling fit into this, if at all? Yeah, so this is something that is, I suppose I would argue, low cost. Um, there's a little bit of a time investment, um, but you can do this at home. There's a lot of devices that are out there, these sort of, you know, pins. And, and I'm not a huge proponent of, like, the derma rolling. Um, I've seen it work, you know, some anecdotally. People will use the derma roller. Maybe they're doing that, applying minoxidil, specifically not within 24 hours of creating this sort of wounding that's there. Uh, but you're basically simulated wounding is what's happening. So the body senses, hey, there's been some tissue damage here. We should devote extra resources to repairing that. And because you're sort of chronically doing this, then you are you know, tricking the body into growing more hair because a byproduct of having more nutrients diverted to that area to heal the wounding is that you have faster hair growth. Um, and it is one of the things you can sort of stack together, right? So if you're looking at you know, addressing DHT a bit or using a growth agonist. Microneedling is another, I suppose I could call it a growth agonist, but it's going to make each of those things you do work better. Um, and as far as a protocol there, because you know, people do like protocols, I think there's a book coming out by Andrew Huberman called Protocols, which I think is a super cool name. Uh, but usually every one to two weeks, like you wouldn't want to microneedle before it feels like you're scalp has fully healed um so if it's still tender to the touch you know maybe give it another week or so um and the depth doesn't necessarily have to be the same one and a half millimeter that's commonly used in the studies really they're just treating to uh, erythema which means redness and endpoint bleeding so not where like blood is dripping down your face but where you know you can see okay there's like a few little like looks like a pinprick of like blood droplets there so yeah. it shouldn't be like running down the face. And some people can get that at half a millimeter. Some people need to go up a little bit more to one millimeter. So you're sort of individualizing it once again, because everybody has different skin thickness. So somebody who's 20 years old versus someone who's 80 years old, they're probably going to have very different levels of dermal thickness. Mm. That's super interesting. The, um, the other one that comes to mind of, uh, is you know red, red light is often disputed for loads of different benefits but one thing i'm pretty sure you can claim in it on insurance in the us at least is for wound healing and uh that would fly um so i wonder if red, adding red light to that sort of wound healing process might could be efficacious do, do you have any thoughts on adding red light to that stat? yeah i mean if you're looking at checking all the boxes the the red light does work so they've had these sort of um, I guess hats or helmet devices with the diodes in them and so forth. Um, it's a larger time commitment. The cost is higher and the results are not quite as good. But if the answer is like, does it work? Yes or no. Like you will have more hairs per square inch on your scalp using one of those, adding it in. Um, the question is, is it going to move the needle enough for most people? Mm. So I, I think red light is super interesting. I, I think sometimes the marketing is a little bit ahead of the research, but to your point with like wound healing or, um, you know, promoting mitochondrial function within the eye, like the ocular tissue specifically, I think there's been quite good data for that for some time now. Now, as far as like rejuvenating the whole body and like driving weight loss and some of these other claims that I see made, I think that's a little bit reaching, but definitely like it's going to be helpful 
um, if you're looking at a pie chart, it's just not going to be the largest slice of pie in terms mm. of your like hair growth progress. Mm. Yeah, that, that that makes a lot of sense. It's interesting what's coming out. I mean, we spoke to a chap called Dr. Glenn Jeffries who had all these wonderful studies about red light lowering blood glucose after a meal as opposed to not, which I thought was it's fascinating to see what other implications come out off the red light. But yeah, I, I completely agree that the sort of um, life-changing benefits you see on social media from some influencer selling it is uh, sometimes quite funny. Um, shifting gears slightly, actually, so one more thing on on, on regrowth. So, you, so there's stopping the hair uh, loss, but then there's also actually adding the regrowth back in. Um, that regrowth, you, with this kind of protocol, can people expect to see some regrowth um, in in that, or is that sort of very case dependent? If you're lucky, you might get some. Yeah, I, I would say regrowth is the norm. If you even look at the like finasteride studies where they're using, you know, a milligram a day, uh, within the 12 months, you're getting you know, about half of people who are getting regrowth. So it would be expected that if you are addressing DHT in some manner, adding in, you know, minoxidil or latanoprost, not everybody tolerates, you know, every treatment. Um, I think it would be the expected result. So it wouldn't be like, you know, if you get lucky, then you are if you start earlier, you do tend to have better results. So if someone is 65 and slick bald on top, um, that's kind of an uphill battle. And, you know, realistically, I'm, I'm not going to try and tell that person that like, yeah, we can get you back to your 18 year old hairline. You know, you can always try things and see what happens. Some people are like hyper responders and those are the cases you'll see people going posting about on you know, Twitter or Reddit. And they're like, I did this for six months and I got all my hair back. And I would say that is not the norm. But in terms of just like year to year, your hair looking better, I would say that, yes, that is more likely to occur. And if you look at um, the stage that you start treatment at, like if you're, you know, uh, let's say stage one or two, like early hair loss, uh, there's the Norwood scale. People can go and Google and, and look at that if they want to. But if you start early stage, and this data does come from some Asian populations, but you might expect to see continued improvement all the way out to five years after you start something like dutasteride or finasteride. Okay, brilliant. Um, this, my, I guess my next question sort of shifts us into the sort of uh, natural testosterone realm, um, if, if we're good to go there. The, how does someone um, looking to keep optimal hormone levels uh, at a very good manner, how do they... Um, what other things can they do to ensure that as they start this protocol, they are feeling good and are sort of, they don't have any symptoms of low T because of the hair loss intervention? Right, right. So, I mean, you, you can absolutely have low testosterone and hair loss happening at the same time. So just because someone is you know, having hair loss, you don't assume that, you know, their testosterone, it must get a very good level because they're so androgenic. So that's where we go to blood work and kind of get your baseline to start and um, proper timing of that testing. It, even the um, uh, urology societies here in, in the United States will say, you know, two levels between like 8 and 10 a.m., you know, ideally fasting. Um, there's some interesting data with like if you do have what I assume most Americans are having for breakfast, something like high sugar or sugar sweetened beverages, um, that will actually acutely decrease your testosterone. So if you, you know, chug an orange soda on your way to the lab core to get your blood drawn, like very likely your testosterone level is taking a hit from that. So uh, that's just a consideration there, kind of seeing what your baseline is and getting a couple of readings. Like you don't diagnose a low testosterone from like a single reading and the evening. Um, you, you will have levels kind of drop off throughout the day. It won't be like, you know, dropping by 80%. Like you don't start the day with a thousand and then it's 200 by the end of the day, but about a third, you know, you might start at a thousand and then you drop to six, 700 by the end of the day. That's kind of the magnitude of change you would expect. So a lot of having good levels of testosterone is doing the right things in your day-to-day -day life. So prioritizing sleep, um, exercising, um, you know, eating the right things, the right amount of calories. Um, interesting dietary fat is probably one of the most overlooked things here where people are, you know, want to lose weight and they'll Google and go on like a low fat diet and they're sort of handicapping their testosterone production in doing so. Uh, like if you're looking at a like percent of calories from fat, 
if you go from, let's say, 45% of your calories from fat to 25% of your calories from fat, uh, which actually isn't that crazy of a change, you may see like 100 to 200 nanogram per deciliter drop, assuming you're starting with a healthy level of testosterone. So it can have a big effect. And, and the reason that happens is that dietary fat does seem to upregulate some of the enzymes involved in the synthesis of testosterone or production of testosterone. So that's something we're always looking at if, if someone is, you know, trying to lose, you know, body fat because losing body fat, if you are like the standard American, the general population where you're have a substantial amount of body fat to lose, you want to make sure you do keep dietary fat in there to support your hormone profile while you are reducing calories and exercising, losing weight. Um, because that's a pretty linear, you know, increase that you'll see. So if someone starts with a BMI of, you know, 35 and they cut down and, you know, BMI isn't perfect, but assuming that they are purely adiposity and, and 35 is that's, that's why their BMI is 35, if they cut down and they lose 100, 150 pounds of fat, their hormone profile is going to look remarkably better. They're going to be able to produce much more testosterone. All the machinery in the body is just going to work so much better. Uh, and then a lot of the same things like, you know, your vitamin D, you know, magnesium is probably one of the most under-consumed things in a, like a industrialized modern diet. So making sure you are getting those things and sort of setting your body up for success. Um, that's sort of the first layer I would say is just the lifestyle. And we can talk about, you know, supplementation and, and what things can actually raise testosterone. Mm. Uh, but I would say the, the foundation of this is just like living the lifestyle you're supposed to be. Yeah, I, I get... I get, um, I think it's overly simplistic to say when, when, when you hear people say, oh, this will always increase testosterone in everyone because everyone's, their own body is so different, right? I mean, bar sort of, you know, pinning testosterone, you know, that will do it. But if, if it's, uh, some sort of supplement or protocol or I don't know, regimen, I, I think everyone is case dependent. Um, when we think about low testosterone, um, all those, there could be lots of different case studies of why you have low testosterone. And I'd love to just put a few sort of cases and maybe how you would, um, work with that person to alleviate, alleviate their symptoms of low testosterone. So the first one would be, um, standard, they have low total testosterone. If someone came to you with low total testosterone and, um, their free testosterone was low as a result as well. Um, normal SHGB, sex, normal sex hormone binding globulin, um, and normal cortisol, what would you, how would you work with that person? Yeah. So kind of looking at the, let's say we have knocked out all the, the lifestyle things and they're doing the right things, getting plenty of sleep. It's just consistently low. And they have like, you know, symptoms of that where they, you know, they're sore after a workout for five or six days, whereas you know, 10 years ago, it was like, you know, they had a day or two of soreness and they could get back to it. So they're sort of seeing that their, you know, libido has dropped off, their exercise recovery has dropped off, you know, that perhaps they're not depressed, but they, they don't feel right. They feel kind of off, like I shouldn't be feeling this way. Something has changed. That's a big clue. Um, then you can look at sort of that natural optimization. That's typically where I'm going to start for each person because, you know, it does have more variability. Not every, you know, supplement I tell someone to take for their testosterone is going to raise them to the upper half of the range. Um, but it also has, you know, less downside, less side effects compared to if you go right to a pharmaceutical intervention. So the Tonkhead Ali, usually a 1% extract is the most common that's out there. It is important to look at the label because some of these may be a 10% extract. And it may be 10 times more potent than, you know, something that's a 1%. But if we're talking about a 1%, you know, anything from 400 up to 800 milligrams of that um, has been shown to raise testosterone. It probably has the most data behind it in terms of like half a dozen studies or so showing it raises testosterone, um, perhaps can lower sex hormone binding globulin a bit. Um, the effect I think is more pronounced in women than men, but it will raise free testosterone generally in women as well. Um, and it seems that just, again, the same thing dietary fat sort of does is upregulate the production of testosterone, those specific enzymes that are taking cholesterol and pregnenolone into eventually testosterone. That's probably the most common thing I'm going to say, like, hey, 
your foundational things, your micronutrients, all this is in check. Let's go ahead and add in some Tom Kedali. And depending on how much we have to gain or how much work we have to do, I may recommend a couple of things, sort of um, not start it all together at the same time, but sort of staged in at you know, a couple of week intervals. So if someone has a level of 250 nanogram per deciliter, and my goal is to have them, let's just say 600 nanogram per deciliter, that would put most people in the upper half of the range. Um, just Tong Kedali by itself, it's probably not going to get them that magnitude of an increase. So we may also add in some uh, specific type of ashwagandha that's been studied. Um, it, what's good for fertility is typically good for testosterone. So with this, um, it's been shown to improve different semen parameters, sperm count, motility, uh, kind of acts as a testicular antioxidant. And uh, it's, it's KSM-66. I, I don't have any affiliation, but it's like a trademarked uh, sort of blend of ashwagandha. Um, so if you buy the cheapest thing off the shelf, it, it may have different amounts of root, stem, leaf, different extract, that sort of thing. Um, but that's the one that has these clinical studies behind it. And that's also shown to give about a hundred uh, nanogram per deciliter increase. The Tonkat Ali, depending on the paper you look at it, maybe hundred to maybe 250 nanogram per deciliter on the top end. Um, so that's kind of what you're looking at as far as generally the first two things I'm going to go to outside yeah. of just lifestyle, nutrition, and nutrient status. Mm. I think on the nutrient, uh, on the sort of dietary piece, I think uh, just overall calorie, calorie intake as well is, is such a, you know, you get people sort of uh, trying to get in shape for summer and all this, all these things, and just the chronic calorie restriction. I mean, that will ripple anyone's, uh, anyone's testosterone, and I guess more specifically, maybe free testosterone. Um, I see that with people's blood a fair bit. But the, um, my next question of the sort of phenotype, if they came to you with like, oh, James, this is, this is my blood panel, my total testosterone is reading, you know, high to normal. I'm like 750, 800, but my free testosterone is super low, like maybe 1% or 0.5% of my total. Um, my SHGB is through the roof really high. How would you help that person? Yeah. And if you're looking at just the free testosterone result in the lab panel, this is something people may find helpful. I haven't found the free testosterone value the lab provides to be particularly helpful, but you can go online and use one of these free testosterone calculators. You know, they're typically developed by andrologists and, um, you can plug in your albumin, your sex from a binding globulin, your total testosterone, and it'll give you a pretty reasonable estimate of what your free testosterone actually is. Cause I've seen some of these labs where, you know, we're rechecking something and it, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, it's like, well, there's no way that your testosterone dropped by 200 nanogram per deciliter, but your free testosterone went up uh, by triple. You know, the, the body just doesn't behave like that. So in, in interpreting the lab values, that's sort of just uh, maybe something for people to take away and then go kind of compare the values they're getting into the calculator. But to your point, a lot of people do have this higher level of sex or binding globulin, especially as they increase in age. You know, you're going to see a natural rise in sex or binding globulin. Um, you'll see it much higher in calorie deprivation, like you mentioned. So someone who is, you know, in a, a cutting phase, especially if they have cut carbohydrates a lot, or someone who's doing a ketogenic diet, um, that will tend to drive up the sex hormone binding globulin as well. Um, and even overtraining. So I, I say that cautiously because most people are not overtraining. Most people are not training enough or not exercising enough. But if you truly have someone like, you know, let's say they're at the end of a training block for a marathon, they're probably overtrained. Their SHPG is probably going to be quite high because of that. So basically looking at all those factors, if I have someone who is doing a ketogenic diet, um, if they don't have a true like medical necessity to do that, um, they just you know, heard keto is great and wanted to try it for weight loss, something like that. I'll typically recommend people to keep at least 75 to 150 grams of carbohydrates in sort of depending on body size you know if it's a 120 pound female versus a 220 pound man different amounts of carbohydrates and also it, it matters with like how much exercise somebody is doing generally more exercise we like to keep a little bit more carbohydrate in for the glycogen replenishment um, but a lot of times that's all that's needed to pretty drastically lower the sex from a binding globulin 
you know, maybe that gets somebody from that, you know, sort of 60 down to between 35 and 40. And now their free testosterone is normalized. They don't have this like inappropriate, you know, elevated amount of sex from a binding globulin. Um, same thing with the calories, you know, um, someone is you know, taking exogenous thyroid hormone, perhaps they have, um, hypothyroidism or it, it's somewhat common here for like these functional medicine providers to put people on a little bit of thyroid hormone to help with weight loss. Um, that can also drive up the sex hormone binding globulin. Um, if uh, more so in females looking at like oral contraceptives, that's another thing that can drive up the sex hormone binding globulin. But you're basically asking yourself, you know, why is it high? Is there a reversible cause there? And mm -hmm. if you can go down and, and check off those boxes, like, okay, let's just get the calories right. Let's add some carbohydrate back in. Let's dial back your training 20, 30%. Um, a lot of times we can get them to maintain that nice high total testosterone. So maybe 750, I think you said. And then their free testosterone also normalizes to instead of like single digits to somewhere in the teens, maybe now it's like a 14 or 15 nanogram per deciliter. Okay, brilliant. The, uh, with regards to, um, I guess, other ways to free up testosterone so i guess to lower that shgb um what about things like boron um what was it did does boron have a place yeah it, it can uh it's generally a pretty small effect in my experience so maybe you know, the average person i'm expecting you know, maybe a 10 percent decrease um some people are going to get a better response than that and it's something that can ha potentially have some other health benefits lowering uh, like C-reactive protein, just kind of lowering inflammation in the body. Uh, boron can do that as well. So I think it's worth adding in. Uh, the Tone Cat Ali, like I mentioned, that's something else from a supplementation standpoint that could tend to lower that. There's also uh, like stinging nettle, which seems like it can lower the SHBG a bit. Um, but that one also seems to be uh, potentially like a, a bit of a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. Yeah, sort of thinking like the saw palmetto. Um, you know, might be able to lower the serum DHT. So you could get a picture on paper where yeah, SHBG is a little bit lower, but it also looks like this person has a little bit less DHT around now. So they may not necessarily feel more optimized or androgenic. Mm. Um, I would say most people are not particularly sensitive to the DHT, but some people can really feel the difference between like, you know, when they have a normal level of DHT versus when that is suppressed. If they have really good biofeedback or they're particularly androgen sensitive perhaps mm -hmm. so in my my own blood work and this is just um you know nf1 when i like following a ketogenic diet when i'm in bouts of work i just i don't know maybe the gaba suppression no idea but i feel more productive and uh when i do mm -hmm. that without taking boron my shgb does tend to trend a bit higher um sort of up towards like you know high 40s low 50s um but when i take boron it does it comes down way more significantly than if i'm not on a ketogenic diet if i'm not on a ketogenic diet it doesn't really move the needle if i am it moves it mm -hmm. much more significantly just in you know probably like three or four panels yeah. of mine which is just interesting but i haven't quite been able to figure that one out but um yeah keeps things ticking i guess um with regards to the a good candidate for trt um what would that profile look look like versus someone who actually they just need to sort of focus on more lifestyle and spend. Yeah. So, I mean, good candidate for TRT is they've sort of, you know, run the gamut of natural optimization. Um, they've tried everything lifestyle wise, supplement wise, and you know, it's variable. I would say if I put just someone on Tonket Ali, it's probably about a third, a third, a third. So a third of people are not going to really see much of an improvement third of people see, you know, a modest improvement. And then a third of people just seem to respond very well to it. It's like those enzymes that are being upregulated are very much their rate limiting step in production. So you have variability and inevitably you know, some people are going to need testosterone. And, um, even the example I gave of, you know, person with you know, obesity, you know, having a health condition there just because they are you know, in this state of health condition doesn't mean, you know, well, we need to spend the next three years losing weight before you're allowed to get testosterone and feel good because their levels may not go up. And that can be part of a tool, you know, in the appropriate person, um, you know, make sure they don't have sleep apnea. So if a person has sleep apnea or you think they might have sleep apnea, they're probably not a good candidate to start testosterone until that's you know, resolved or treated because testosterone can worsen sleep apnea. 
So you know, what, what happens in perhaps some of the telemedicine testosterone space where they're more volume based and, you know, less time with the patients, they may you know, start people on testosterone, check back in two, three months. And, you know, this person's levels look great on paper, but they're like, I feel more tired than I ever have. That's because their sleep quality has worsened significantly. Mm. So that's one of the things that makes someone, you know, not a good candidate. Um, if someone has truly, let's say, checked all those boxes and I'm sort of creating an avatar of that, um, we see where they're at with fertility. So the myth out there is that testosterone creates permanent infertility. I've, I've heard, you know, urologists say this, it's like, well, don't go on testosterone. You're never going to be able to have kids. Um, that's not, certainly not the case. It does, and it can create a temporary infertility, but it's also not effective birth control. So, um, you know, just cause you're on testosterone doesn't mean, Hey, don't have to worry about it. Um, because you can still you know, conceive during that time period. So if someone is in a spot where they say, well, you know, I'm, we're, we're planning to conceive in six months, probably not the time to start testosterone. Um, you could consider something like, you know, HCG, which is, um, generic for pregnant. Um, that's sometimes used as a monotherapy. Um, it's most commonly used in fertility medicine at quite high doses, uh, in men who it basically produce zero sperm. They may have azoospermia. Uh, maybe they have um, a genetic abnorm abnormality or for whatever reason they found that they have this infertility. And at the doses that they use for fertility, you will often see serum level of testosterone above 2,000. Now, that creates another set of problems because those levels are arguably higher than optimal and you get a lot of conversion to estradiol with the use of that high of a dose of HCG. So like things like nipple sensitivity, fluid retention, um, mood changes, like those things can and will happen there. So you use maybe a 20% you know, of the fertility dose, you can get the effect of improving your natural testosterone production. And you're not sort of um, throwing away a perfectly good set of testicles in that manner. If they have the capability and you're just saying that, hey, you know, your, your LH is not elevated. This doesn't look like, um, you know, your testes have just sort of burned out or fizzled out. Um, but a younger person, you know, someone that's below the age of 50, perhaps, um, generally they're going to be a little bit better candidate, but on paper, we'll look at the LH and FSH, which in simple terms are just the, the signal the brain sends the testes to produce testosterone, uh, the pituitary specifically. And then if someone does have like a true, what looks like primary hypogonadism, or they don't respond to the pregnal, then yeah, a lot of times testosterone makes sense. It's going to improve their quality of life, which is the main reason for treatment at the end of the day. And there's some, you know, additional metabolic benefits, you know, they're going to get more results out of the work they're putting in from a diet and exercise standpoint. Um, and I think it will give them a better, you know, health span as far as overall longevity and lifespan. I'm inclined to say probably, um, but a lot of times that person is a good candidate. Uh, the most common form is going to be, uh, like a testosterone cypionate or an anthate injection, um, historically and probably still the most commonly prescribed protocol is, you know, one big shot every two weeks. It is becoming more popular for people to sort of, you know, microdose this and, and do several injections per week, maybe Monday and Thursday. Um, that way they keep relatively stable blood levels instead of going way up above the normal range and then, you know, having it completely out of your system before you are doing your next injection. I mean, in, in talking with you know, people and families, that's pretty common where, you know, maybe the, the gentleman getting the testosterone doesn't realize it, but you know, the family will sort of poke fun and say, oh, you know, dad's getting cranky again, must be time for his testosterone shot. And it's just a very common story that you'll hear over and over when people are on these protocols that are spaced out a bit more. Mm. Okay. That's, uh, that, that, that's good to know. I mean, I don't know what it's like in the U S but here in the UK, I think you get more and more people who are entertaining the idea in their sort of early to mid twenties. Um, which I guess there is a pool of people within that category who probably would benefit from it and, you know, exhaust all options, but I would hazard a guess to there's a large percentage of people who there's probably a few more, um, things to try before they just jump straight on. Um, but as you said, it's a really salient point. It's not a, uh, it's not the life sentence. Um, you know, you're in this forever and, you know, good luck ever going back to natural um, status. Um, am I right in saying that's a misconception as well? Yeah. I mean, it, 
I always, when I'm discussing this with, you know, uh, either a friend or even a patient that's, you know, we're talking about going on testosterone, then I will say, you know, think of it as like a, a therapeutic trial where we're trying something. It doesn't mean you're going to be on taking the injections the rest of your life. Um, we'll see, do you get the benefits we're looking for? Are we having any side effects that we think are outweighing the benefits? What does the blood work look like? Are we causing any problems that we're able to measure on, on the paper? What's your blood pressure look like? So we're doing this very carefully. And then um, it's quite easy to come off of testosterone if you've been on it for a short time. So say you know, less than one year. So typically I'll, I'll tell them, let's take this three month block, check some blood work about six weeks after you start. If we need to make a dose adjustment up or downwards, we can do that. And then in the three months we'll decide is you know, this something that like you think is sustainable, that is bettering your quality of life or something that has, you know, really not made a difference. And at that point, those people can probably just come off cold turkey. They don't need to necessarily do a, what's commonly called like a post cycle therapy. Um, because, you know, around month three is generally when you're just only going to start to see a little bit of the testicular atrophy. Uh, but if someone's been on for two years, five years or 10 years, we probably want to have a little bit more involved process to get things up and running more quickly if they're coming off of testosterone. Mm. Um, and we, we've done this with patients, and sometimes this is a really cool case to see someone who went on testosterone, let's say when they were in that 35 BMI, struggling with obesity, they worked really hard, they've greatly improved their health over three, five years, and now they're like, I want to see if I still need this testosterone. Um, sometimes you can see those people come off of the testosterone and now their natural levels are, you know, perhaps twice as high as they were when they were in that poor state of health. So they've totally normalized and they actually don't need it anymore. Um, now eventually for most men, you know, with tissue aging, it probably will make sense at some point, but some men maintain really good production in their sixties, seventies. Um, although that is sort of the minority that's out there, but you can see that once in a while and it's like, well, you know, that's great. You don't necessarily you don't need testosterone at this point. You know, numbers look great. Brilliant. It's uh, yeah, it, it's it's a a good uh, it's a good area. I think there needs to be slightly more education on in the UK. I think America's a little bit ahead of us, but um, yeah, I think uh, it, it it's very good education. Um, shifting gears to a wonderful video you and Dr. Carl Gillette did on um the Biden and Trump presidential debate before the debate. Um, which was you went, you, you, you both offered a protocol, um, a different arrangement of things that the two candidates could do to optimize their debate performance focused around their, um, their own, uh, I guess, cognitive function, which post debate shows it probably was, they should have watched the video. Um, my question to you <laughs> is if you had a debate coming up or a big pitch or a, you know, something you had to be cognitively on for let's use the debate you know you're running for, for, for us president what would your own protocol look like the 24 hours before yeah i mean the most important thing is being familiar with like the source material that you're referencing um and i think that's a, a weakness of a lot of politicians <laughs> um so I'll, I'll leave that there but as far as you know like what i would do now is pretty minimal um, so like a good night's sleep, you know, the night before, um, what I would do the day of is probably a bit of, um, like caffeine, probably in the form of, of coffee or something like that. Um, a nicotine patch. And personally, that's something that I will use about every two weeks. Um, and I say that cautiously, I see people getting in trouble with like the Zen's and nicotine mm -hmm. lozenges and things like that, where they start with like, you know, they're doing one, one a day, something like that. And then all of a sudden they're doing 20 times a day and then when they don't take it they feel like crap so if someone has an addictive personality of all I, I do have a lot of caution around nicotine but for myself personally like it's phenomenal whenever i use it i'll put on the lowest dose patch for about three or four hours and i have a very productive sort of block to work with um, just on it, that in the state that i'm in could i just double click on um why patch over a gum for example yeah so I use a patch because with the gum and oral nicotine, it looks like it could drive a little bit of oxidative stress like in the, the gum tissue and cause some tissue damage. Um, I don't know if specifically there's a local vasoconstriction effect there where it would contract blood vessels and reduce blood flow. 
but I would rather that be happening, you know, on my abdomen, hip, you know, wherever I'm putting the patch at than in the oral mucosa. And it's also going to hit harder if you're using something that's going to go sublingual like that. So you have a lot of blood vessels there uh, under the tongue, in between the, you know, the gum, the cheek. So it may be a bit too excitatory and that may have some negative effects. So for myself, it's like, I don't necessarily need it to kick in right away. Um, I, I like the patch and it, if I'm going back to, you know, let's say I was you know, 18 years old in college, you know, I did take low doses of Adderall at that time. And in my state of health that I'm in now, where I'm well rested, I'm getting plenty of you know, flavonoids in my diet. Um, it, it's almost indistinguishable for me to use like caffeine plus a nicotine patch. So I don't know that everyone will have that experience, but for myself, using a stimulant-based medication like that, that it just doesn't make a lot of sense when I have these sort of lower risk tools, as I would put them, that are not going to cause the same level of desensitization. So that's probably the foundation of it. Um, I might consider a little bit of, you know, modafinil um, if I didn't sleep particularly well, because that has been shown to reverse some deficits that are seen with sleep deprivation. Uh, creatine has as well at higher doses. That's a, a recent paper that's sort of been floating around out there. I think it was a 20 gram dose that was shown to reduce some of those deficits. Um, it, I think of it like if I'm going in to have surgery done um, and the surgeon didn't sleep well, I certainly would hope that they're using something to offset the deficits from that. Um, and that's modafinil. That, that's great. Um, another reason to use that is like for long road trips. Someone's going to be driving for many, many hours to sort of maintain better alertness. I think that's another good use case for it. And then uh, there's actually one reflumolast, which I don't recall if we mentioned in that video specifically, uh, but this is a PDE4 inhibitor. So uh, Tadalafil is a PDE5 inhibitor, um, works on phosphodiesterase type 5. Um, PDE4 is just another sort of cousin of phosphodiesterase. And it works on cyclic AMP, so it doesn't directly release dopamine or inhibit the reuptake of dopamine like uh, stimulant or wakefulness agents do, like, you know, modafinil, for example. But it sort of amplifies the signal of dopamine between neurons. So it sort of makes the machinery work a little bit better. I guess it's like going from you know, dial-up to high-speed internet. Probably not that extreme of a difference, but... It's something that is out there. It's uncommonly prescribed. This is totally off label. There's no prescription that on the FDA label says like, take this for better cognition. It just you know, doesn't exist. But this has at least two studies now, which I really like to see when something has been replicated and it shows, you know, better cognitive function in healthy young adults. So not somebody who's cognitively impaired, but somebody who has say normal or even good brain function. And it's improving like their memory and word recall and these various things that would be important in debate setting. Um, and I will caution people like I wouldn't like if you've never taken any of these things before, definitely don't take them together all at once. But you're working with your clinician, you know, you sort of try things one at a time and, you know, make sure that you're getting benefits. You're not having adverse effects because if you start four things at once, you're going to be left scratching your head as to like, okay, this went badly. What caused that bad reaction? And then you have to kind of reverse engineer and, and go back and start from scratch. But that's probably the bulk of what I would say, um, you know, I would do after I make sure that I'm familiar with the debate topic and the source material. Wonderful. I think uh, we, we, well, could you remind me what the compound you just mentioned was called? And we'll, I'll look for the studies and put them in the, in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. I can uh, shoot you an email with those. Uh, yeah, it's great. called Reflumalast. Uh, on brand, it's uh, Dalarest that's used for COPD here in the United States. And I think they use it in a topical perhaps for uh, like psoriatic arthritis because it has some anti-inflammatory properties as well. Um, I don't know if that's perhaps a mechanism of, of why it also helps with cognitive function, um, but it's something that is fairly low cost and generic at this point. Uh, just not a lot of people have heard of it. Okay. Well, interesting. That's, uh, I'm pleased I asked. That was a brilliant answer. Um, some quick fire questions to, to finish us off. Um, what, do you have any books that have shaped your worldview or, I mean, they don't have to be related to health, just some books that particularly, that particularly resonate with you. 
yeah, I do like to read. Um, most of that is like uh, medical literature at this point, but I think there's a lot of merit to uh, like the comfort crisis. So sort of if you look at society as a whole in the modern world, we're doing a lot of things that, you know, our brains are not wired for us, I would say, you know, you know, sitting inside, staring at screens, you know, not moving much, you know, eating foods that aren't familiar with us. So I think no matter what area somebody is looking at in their life, if they want growth in that area or improvement in that area, it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable. So I, I don't know. I've heard it said by so many people. I don't know who originally coined it, but like being comfortable with being uncomfortable um, is sort of a you know, something that I think is, you know, a good principle to incorporate into somebody's life. So like, yeah, if you're you know losing weight, it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable. If you're pushing yourself in the gym or trying to get in better aerobic shape, it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable. Even something like spiritual growth for people, it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable. So sort of realizing that that's okay and that's normal and that like we have the resilience to handle that, I think building a mindset around that uh, is very helpful, at least for me personally. Lovely. I completely agree. I think it's, it's a wonderful book as well. Um, and I would echo, echo that uh, there's a lot of benefit to reading it. Um, in the last year, what new behavior or habit that you've incorporated? Or maybe let's, let's span it to two years. Um, last two years, what behavior or habit you incorporated that's had the most impact in your health? Yeah, two years. Let's see. Uh, I guess one of the biggest things hasn't necessarily had an impact on my health, but as far as getting into um, you know, running. So historically, I was just more of a, you know, weightlifter. And if I go back 10 years ago, I certainly didn't care about cardio at all. But as I've seen more and more evidence of how important that is for overall health and longevity, um, I, I did incorporate cardio. And then here, I suppose over the last six to nine months, I've incorporated some running um, and sort of going through the, the shin splints and some of those things that happen when you try to ramp up too quickly. Um, I think that provides me with some good experience to draw from whenever I'm talking with patients um, that sort of choose running as their primary modality of exercise and being able to sort of draw from that. Um, and I, I, it does help me to get outside a lot more. So I would say that over the past two years, I'm probably yeah, spending more time outside than ever. Um, certainly more than when I worked, you know, night shift, if we go back like, you know, four or five years ago, I uh, worked night shift for five years and um, I thought I felt good doing that, but then, you know, you switch to day shift and your circadian rhythm, right? And you're like, oh, this is what, like feeling really good is supposed to be. So that's another big change, but that's going back a little bit farther than two years. But yeah, I would say like getting outside, running, having a good circadian rhythm, um, just doing new things, right? Like learning a new skill seeing improvements there, like that always has a, a really good, um, uh, reward attached to it, right? Psychologically, it feels good and sort of reinforces the habit. Mm, lovely. I really, that's, uh, me too. I need to, I need to do, I like sprinting lots, especially interval sprints, but the long form slow mm. zone two thing and I, I need to get a bit better at, um, it, what important truths do very few people agree with you on? Hmm. An important truth. Yeah, that's, that's a, it's an interesting one. Let's see. Uh, maybe I'll give like a, a hot take or perhaps an unpopular opinion. Um, so I'll do one kind of funny and then one a bit serious. So the kind of funny one is that like sugar sweetened beverages should just be like financially out of reach. So like a two liter of orange soda should be $60. It shouldn't be $1 because then you eliminate the use of that. Uh, the more serious one would be that uh, instead of labeling things like processed foods, let's say like, uh, like highly processed foods, people like always avoid highly processed foods. Um, if you look at something like a protein bar, even if it has very good macros, um, low calorie, high protein, it's, it's still like a processed or even ultra processed food. So I think the label... Um, that needs to occur there is something that looks at like a percentage of calories that are coming from sugar uh, or carbohydrate and fat rather than looking at like, oh, this is ultra processed, so avoid it. Because you can have some things that are going to improve people's metabolic health that are, you know, quote unquote, ultra processed. 
um, but kind of looking at sugar content and fat content. And I, I think they may do this in, um, in Mexico. I, I've been there once and on the labels of things, you'll see like, you know, this is high in fat or this is high in sugar. So, you know, sort of just when, I guess it's a more of a nuance in the health influencer space when people are talking about ultra process this and ultra process that I, I think the way innovation is going, things are still going to be ultra processed, but they're going to radically change the uh, composition of what's in them. So if you have something with protein and allulose as the sweetener, that's going to immediately lower blood sugar. Whereas if you have something processed that is pure sugar, like a candy bar, you know, that's just going to spike somebody's blood glucose and they're not really getting any nutrient value out of that other than, you know, it has calories. So I think the way forward will be you know, innovation that still will be processed foods there, um, sort of like weaning people off of the junk food and onto you know, something that's more nutritious and more protein in it. Um, and I would love for everyone to go and just start eating whole foods and very naturally. It just it's not necessarily realistic for most people, I would say, but I think it's something we should strive for. That's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful idea. I think it would have massive ramifications of public policy and public health if um, if that was actually implemented, especially here in the UK. Um, yeah, brilliant idea. Um, James, I could speak to you all day. You're, you're a fascinating man, and that was a really, really wonderful conversation. Um, where can we find you and keep up to date uh, with your work? Yeah, so I, I'm probably most active on Instagram. That's at James O'Hara NP. Uh, and then I'm also the co-host of the Gillette Health Podcast. So if you Google that or type it in on YouTube or Apple Podcasts, um, Spotify, I think we're even on uh, Twitter, which is now X. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, we're on all the platforms there. And that's myself and Dr. Kyle Gillette uh, diving into lots of different you know facets and topics under the health and fitness umbrella. I can echo that it's brilliant I encourage you to go check it out um, thank you very much James for coming on yeah thanks so much for having me this has been a lot of fun <laughs>